Today in the EU, what does the UK election mean for the EU? Um, I, I actually would have voted for the Conservative, which I have done all my life, but I, I really don't know. For, for a lot of people, it'll be about getting the Conservatives out of government. I'm going to vote Labour. Uh, I think um, we need someone that's going to do right by the people. After 14 years of Conservative government, citizens in the UK will head to the polls today to vote in the general election, as predictions indicate a landslide victory for the centre-left Labour Party over the Conservatives. Questions arise about what a Labour win would mean for the EU-UK relations and why, while the rest of Europe is shifting right, the UK seems to be moving left. Hello and welcome, I'm Nicoletta Yonta and this is Today in the EU. But because we will be the only party that can change our society for the better. Do you want real change? Because we're the only party. We have one job, which is to make this a summer of change. To understand the implications of the vote, the major players and the European consequences, we're joined in the studio by Catherine Fear, your Actives editor. Hello, Catherine. Good morning. Catherine, before we kick off, can you give us an overview of the main political parties and the key players that are facing off in today's general election? So the main parties are the Conservative Party, the current party in government. Formerly, it was aligned with the European People's Party, as we know it. However, under David Cameron in particular, he moved them to a new group, the European Conservative and Reform Group, slightly to the right from being a a traditionally centre-right party. Then we have the Labour Party, which was traditionally aligned with the S&D group in the parliament. The other party is the Liberal Democrats, who are aligned with the ALDE group. Of course, one of the players in this election will be the Reform Group that is being led by the certain Mr. Mm -hmm. Nigel Farage, you may have heard of him. Never. (laughs) He will be bringing his own um, view on things. We've seen them come up in the polls quite a lot, now standing at 16% of the vote. Okay, and when we talk about leaders of these parties, who are we referring to? For the Conservative Party, it's Rishi Sunak. He's been there since Liz Truss left after 49 days. So the Prime Minister now? Yeah. Since uh, 49 days, Liz Truss promptly left the stage and uh, was replaced by Rishi Sunak. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time he has put himself forward in a general election. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's the first general election since 2019, which was won by Boris Johnson with the aim of getting Brexit done. Get Brexit done and let's bring this country together. Let us to understand what to expect in terms of polls, we also asked Matthew Nicholson, Europe Elect's deputy team leader and UK correspondent, to break the data down for us. Matthew, you have been following these elections closely. Tell us, what can we expect a new parliament to be like and in which ways will it be different from the last one? So this election in the UK has seen a huge number of seat projections, which we call MRP projections. Um, And what they're showing is that there's going to be a very decisive Labour majority. Um, They're all showing Labour between 406 seats and 516 seats, which is well above the 326 seats you need on paper for a majority. Mm -hmm. And they're showing the Conservative number of seats crashing down to between 53 seats and 155 seats. Um, Now, this would well easily be the worst Conservative result in over a century, possibly in the entire history of the party, if this happened. And how many seats did they used to have? They had 365 seats uh, at the last election. Yeah, so even the the best case scenario here of 155 seats or so, um, which we're seeing in the projections, they'd only hold on to less than half of the seats that they went into the election with. So yeah, that, that would be a, a complete wipeout of the Conservatives. The worst case scenario, of course, being you know, reduced to somewhere in like the double digits. What would you say the most interesting element of the new parliament is going to be then? The kind of flashy headline number is obviously going to be the size of the Labour majority. But I think actually the performance of the smaller parties is, is going to be both interesting in their own right, but I think also will be quite indicative in shaping the size of that overall Labour majority we're likely to get. And back to you, Catherine. We know that the Conservatives will see their support slashed by half. It has been a messy decade for the party indeed. With five different prime ministers in 14 years, um, how did we get to this point? What happened? So in 2010, the Conservatives came to power in a coalition government with the Liberal Democrats. Yes. In 2015, there was a general election that was won by David Cameron's Conservative Party 
one of the famous lines from that election is vote for us for stability rather than chaos with Labour. And famously after that, in 2016, David Cameron took a gamble and we had a referendum on the future of the UK and the EU. The most interesting thing about these elections is that while the rest of Europe is turning right, it seems that the UK is actually shifting left. Why is this happening? A lot of this vote is about the change of power. The Conservatives, like you say, have been in government since 2010. We've seen austerity. We've seen a really unstable series of governments. And people are desperate for stability. Mm -hmm. So I think the primary... (laughs) concern is getting them out of power. Yeah. And I think people will be voting in that way. But Labour have always been to the right of the S&D group, even when they were, they were in the European Parliament. I think it will be welcomed across Europe by social democratic governments. But I don't think this is necessarily a game changer in terms of a move to the left. Polls predict now that the Labour will win today after more than a decade of conservative rule. The question is, what kind of country are they inheriting? As you said, Labour have a 20-point lead in the polls and it looks very much like they are going to win. It's really a question of to what extent. In terms of what they are going to face when they come in to office, well, there are enormous challenges. There are the the known challenges. We know that the public services are on their knees. We've had striking doctors. We have infrastructure that's falling apart. There is a need for huge investment, but there isn't much money to fund this investment. And the Labour Party have taken a very fiscally conservative position in that they will only invest modest amounts, really, by comparison to what is is needed, and that they hope to fund future investment through growth. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to see what they call uncosted spending. So that will be one of the challenges. But it's also a very divided country, a Mm -hmm. country that has been through a very difficult time around Brexit and afterwards, which was a deeply divisive period. And I think a lot of people are looking forward to a more stable and hopefully a more boring government. Complications about the Brexit deals, the rising inflation, and as you mentioned, the deterioration of public services aren't the only challenges that the Conservatives will be facing. In fact, Tories will also have to contend with Nigel Farage, who has made a return to politics. And what impact will he have on these elections and how has his campaign looked so far? The UK has a first-past-the-post system. What's that? Well, it means that in any given constituency, the person who has more votes wins. And -hmm. that can be, like in a horse race, it can be by a nose. So you could have 30,000 votes and the next person could have 29,999 votes and the person with 30,000 votes will win. Mm -hmm. It's not a proportional system. And that means that it's very difficult for smaller parties to get into power. So like the Nigel Farage one. Exactly. So he is very unlikely to get more than a handful of seats. And handful Mm -hmm. may be generous here. The constituency that he's standing in is Clacton. He might win that. There are another two possible constituencies that I see. So his impact on the government will be very limited. It might have a psychological impact on the Conservative Party. Why? Well, they'll probably take votes from Conservatives rather than uh, any other particular group. That will be a worry. And it's it's always been the question that's divided the Conservative Party. And one of the reasons that we ended up with Brexit, it was an attempt to deal with divisions within the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, the solution to deal with these divisions was to have a referendum. Here on the other side of the English Channel, there is much speculation about what the potential implication of a Labour victory will mean for the EU. And of course, what approach will the new government take towards Brussels? What did the Labour Party leader, Keir Starmer, had to say? I think it's going to be positive. Mm. The Labour position is not in support of joining the single market or customs union. It doesn't look very ambitious, but in tone it will be completely different. And there are some positive signs. So, for example, Labour are very interested in cooperation in the area of defence. We have the European political community meeting in Blenheim Palace later in July. That will be an opportunity to show those credentials to, to build cooperation, especially over Ukraine, where there's common interest. 
The other area that's come up is cooperation on what's called, in the jargon, sanitary and phytosanitary provisions. At the moment, though the UK chose not to have an agreement in this area, I think Mm -hmm. they would be pushing on an open door with the EU if they wanted this. And this would be extremely helpful, not just to British farmers as a whole, but it would really help with the situation in Northern Ireland which has a very strong agri-food sector. Mm -hmm. And it could really break down some of these problems that we have over what's called the Irish sea border. Mm -hmm. In addition, Rachel Reeves, the the Chancellor, the Finance Minister, has said that she wants to see more cooperation in areas like chemicals and uh, the financial sector. It gets more difficult when we get closer to the single market. I think the EU will welcome cooperation in defence. It will welcome cooperation in sanitary issues, Mm -hmm. they will be cautious about the single market. They do not want cherry picking. They will be open to cooperation, I think, but I think they will be more circumspect about what can be achieved there. Starmer's first major European challenge, as you mentioned, will be the European Political Committee Summit that he'll host in London. What can we expect from him and what will his handling of this event reveal about his European Union strategy? I think it's going to send out a very positive message. And of course, firstly, there's, there will be a NATO meeting as well. And that will be the first place, I suppose, where there is the possibility of demonstrating that there is a willingness to cooperate on security and defence for the UK with its European partners. Then the further meeting in Blenheim Palace, uh, Mm -hmm. I think that will really cement that. And I don't know what sort of concrete measures they will have in mind. But I I think the signalling will be extremely important. I am Nicoletta Yonta, and this was Euractiv's Today in the EU podcast. Visit Euractiv to stay on top of the latest news, sign up for our podcast newsletter, and if you haven't subscribed yet, you can find us on all streaming platforms. Make sure to leave a comment or a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Your reviews help us a lot to spread the word on our work. This episode was produced by Miriam Sanz de Tejada, Evie Curie, Jada Santana, and me. Thank you for tuning in, and we will be back tomorrow.